Okay, today, today is Wednesday, October the 26th, 2022. And this is the second installment of the wheat, the tares, and the harvest. The wheat, the tares, and the harvest. And because we got a lot to do today, we're going to just jump right into it. Uh, the reading, then we'll do a quick review. We'll do a prayer, then we'll do a quick review. We'll hit the outline as far as we can go, and then we'll close with a prayer as we always do. So let's start with the reading, Matt, and we'll start with Matthew. Matthew still in the book of Matthew, Matthew 3, 1 through 17. Derek, if you'll read for us. In those days came John the Baptist, uh, the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judah and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet uh, Isaiah, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of Yahuwah, make his path straight. In the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern belt about his loins, and his food was of the locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judah and all the region around about the Jordan and were baptized of him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and I don't know what that is in Hebrew. Sadducees. Sadducees coming to his baptism. He said unto them, O offspring of vipers, who was warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For, our si for I say unto you that Elohim is able of those stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bring, brings not forth good fruit is hen hewn down and cast to the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto, the repenta unto repentance. But he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Ruach HaKodesh, or the Holy Spirit, and with fire, whose fan is in his, in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then came Yehusha from Galilee to the Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of you, and come you to me. And Yehusha answered, uh, answering, said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becomes us to fulfill all righteousness that he suffered him. And Yahushua, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water, and lo, the heavens were open unto him, and saw the Ruach Elohim descending like a dove and lightning upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my kid, or beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. I pray that when it's my turn to go before the good Lord, he will say the same thing to me as he said to the Son of God in verse 17. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Man runs around trying to please man. Man, man is only pleased for a season, and as soon as that pleasure is over with, he's looking for you to please him in another way. Uh, so those things that we do to please man are not lasting. The things we do to please God is eternal. Amen. Remember that. It's eternal. Don't get caught up uh, not pleasing God because you have to please some man. What do y'all see there? Anything stand out to y'all in the reading today? You got something, Richard? Uh, let me see here. Uh, I just heard. I just heard him, and his deal went yellow. Thought I, so I thought he had some. Did I put you on the spot? No, I'm good. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I have something. Uh, I just was backing up a little bit. Uh, In verse seven, and it says, 
But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to him, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who had warned you to flee from the wrath to come. And then uh, drop down to uh, verse 10, and it said, and now also the ax is laid unto the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Uh, and what that's saying to me is that, uh, and it, it, it relates to where we are today, because of the, 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 this was the, supposed to have been the leadership of the church and of the, the leadership of the city uh, together. The, and they were the ones that had came out. <clears throat> and it's like up today, we have the church and we have the, the, the leadership of the, of the cities. Uh, and they are the ones that's, that's causing uh, a lot of uh, the people to uh, not uh, do the things that God have called them to do or teaching the, the word of God or, and, and, and helping people to keep the commandments. And so what it's saying is that the time as it was back then is, is now that it is coming closer and closer to the end and it's getting closer to that point to where uh, the, the, where they say the axis is, is, is laid onto the root of the tree and those that are not doing those things, you know, are going to be cut down and those that are keeping God's word, you know, and bringing forth fruit, uh, he's going to gather them unto himself. Amen. Good. Yeah. We see the separation of the wheat and tares, huh? Yes. In this case, uh, you know, uh, we see the, the tree, the whole tree being rotten. If he's going to cut it from the root, then the whole tree's rotten. So with that whole tree, he's going to take it from the root and he's going to take it out. But good, Richard. Yes. The separation between the two different groups, the, what we're calling uh, in this Bible study, the wheat and the tares. Derek, you got anything? Uh, verse eight for me, it okay. says, uh, bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance. And so he's talking to the Pharisees um, and just what stands out to me is just like him telling them to bring something that's actually honorable to um, bring them to a point of repentance, right? To understand the error, like Richard was saying earlier, you know, um, bringing therefore something that's worthy because you've been out of line for the last, well, up until this point, right? So mm -hmm. I just thought that was interesting. It's short, but. It's good. It's, it's short, but it's really, really uh, uh, what we need to understand in the church, because let me give you what's happening a lot of times in the church today so we can have understanding for verse eight. In the church, we're instead of giving you meat for repentance, we're giving you meat for tithe. We don't want to hurt your feelings. We don't want to tell you you're a sinner if you're living in fornication. We don't want to tell you you're an adulterer or a liar or a thief. We don't want to tell you that you're an idolater. So we're saying God loves everybody. That's not meat for repentance. Because if God loves me and I say, like they say now in religion, God knew you were a sinner and he still loves you. Why should I repent? Why should I come out of my sin? If he's going to love me whether I'm a sinner or whether I'm not, which that's not true because God does not love everybody. God says, I hate Esau and love Jacob. Again, two different fruits. One good fruit was Jacob. One bad fruit was Esau. He's talking about the spirit that's within the man, right? So we see here him saying, bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance. So what, what I have to do is, Preach the word. That's that's meat. That's when he when he, when he when he talks to when Paul talks to him in the New Testament and said, "Look, I would have came to you this way, but you're not ready for that, so I had to give you milk because mm -hmm. you ain't ready for meat, right? You're not ready for the true word of God. You're not ready to stand in the truth of the word of God. So I had to pamper you. I had to baby you, and I had to." 
helped you walk until you got ready to walk on your own. That's what Paul was saying to the church. So here you bring forth a really good thing there. Meet worthy of repentance. In other words, what should be coming from the man and woman of God is your sinner. That's the whole gospel. That's what John is doing. He's preparing a way for what is what what do I need most if I'm a sinner? Be the truth. Say, conviction. I need to be saved. I need yeah. the truth. I need to be saved. All the above. I don't need you to be playing around with my sin. And he's saying, look, something's coming, but I you have to teach them the word of God so they'll accept it. If you don't teach them the word of God, you know what they're going to do with Christ? The same thing that the Jews did with Christ. Hand them over to Rome, as Richard was saying, the church handing over the, the word of God, which was Christ to the Romans to be crucified. That's what we do every time when we don't teach the word of God, when we say my mama said or my pastor said or so. I don't care what any of them said. And I, I'm, not, I'm not going against your mother. That's between you and your mother. But I am saying if your mother's saying something different than this book, she's pointing you the wrong direction. If your pastor's saying something different than this book, she, he's pointing you the wrong direction. Amen? DJ, you got anything? Stand out to I mean, you? I was, I mean, I was just looking at it, you know, 11 and 12 and there's no way for me to put it in my perspective. It's kind of clear day. You know, it talks about, but someone is coming soon who is greater than I am. So much greater that I'm not worthy even to be a slave and carry his sandals. He will uh, baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He is ready to separate the shape from the wheat um, with his winnowing fork. Then he will clean up the threshing area, gathering the wheat into his barn, but burning the shape with never ending fire. Um, and for me, I guess it's, it's clear as day when I when I look at this and it kind of explains, you know, that, you know, he's he's coming. And just like what we preach, you know, you preach every every day, it's uh he's gonna separate those <laughs> believers, you know, and those and those non-believers and those ones unfortunately that don't believe, they're gonna um they're they're gonna suffer. Yeah. And I'm glad you said believe today because we're going to have to certify it in the, in the Bible. So we're going to have to certify that word believers, right? Because just because I believe, do I obey? No. Mm -mm. So we got to be careful with that word believer, because there's a lot of people that claim Jesus and a lot of people believe he was the son of God, but do they obey what, what he has written? No. That's the problem, right? It's not meat for repentance, fruits for repentance. Yeah, that's the biggest problem is the men and women that should be teaching scripture are afraid to hurt somebody's feelings. Look, I, I don't mind. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I, I like people, but you know what? I don't do you no favor unless I tell you the truth. Yeah. And as the bleacher seat said, if I truly love you, then I'm willing to risk my relationship with you to bring you out of sin. Let's look at it close. I want you all to get this because we talked last week at the beginning of this outline in reference to the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. Amen. So let's, let's, let's look at what is being said. In those days came John, verse 1 of, of chapter 3. Came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judah and saying, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is what? At hand. Is at hand. See, some people don't understand that. They're still waiting to get to the kingdom of heaven. Well, wait a minute. This was 2,000 years ago, over 2,000 years ago since Christ was crucified. And he's already telling you the kingdom of heaven is what? At hand. At hand. Why is it at hand? Because you got a decision to make. That's why it's at hand. Just because the door is there and it's at hand where I can put my hand on the knob and I can twist it and open it doesn't mean that I'm going to put my hand on the knob, twist it and open it and walk in. 
right? It's at hand, but I have to do something. I have to take some action, some mental note to decide to come in. And if I want to stay in my sin and I know if I go through that door, I can't, will I? What do you love more, God or the sin? What do you love more, the spirit or the flesh? The door is there. Jesus Christ is the door. That's what John is saying to us. And if you walk through that door, then on the other side of that door, guess what? You become sanctified. You become a brother in Christ. You become the sons and daughters of the most high God. Once you go through the process, once you go through the door, there's still work to be done. The Holy Spirit has to come upon you and start working on you and in you. But you got to go into the door first because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. All I got to do is, if something's at my hand, all I got to do is reach out and grab it, right? Verse 3, for this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. You know, a lot of churches and a lot of religions don't want a straight path to Christ. They want you to go through prosperity preaching and once saved, always saved, and all uh, a different Sunday Sabbath and all these other things that man has come up with. That's not a straight path. A lot of times you get lost along the way. There's so many curves in the doctrine. And that's what he's saying here. Make his path straight. And how much straighter is it than the word of God? Can't get no straighter, right? Unless I start adding to it and other men start adding to it. Now you got all these other things. Easter, Christmas, all these other things that they bought into the scripture. It's not in the Bible. Jesus wasn't born on December the 25th. We know. So why are we tell that lie? See how easy Satan gets you to be a liar? And the Bible says all liars will have their place in the lake of fire. We know that Easter is a pagan holiday, that the church made a Christian holiday to bring paganism into the church, but we still celebrate it. We know bunny don't lay eggs, and we know God ain't got nothing to do with eggs and rabbits. But the two biggest days in the church are what? What are the two biggest days in religion? Easter and Christmas. There you go. Is that a straight path to Christ? No, it gets you sidetracked. It gets your kids thinking about the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus instead of Jesus Christ. Who's going to save them? The Easter Bunny and Santa Claus or Jesus Christ? Hmm? What do you think? Santa Claus brings you gifts. Easter brings you eggs. Gifts. The only gift I want is eternal life. That's my religion. The same. Make his path straight. And the, and the same John had his remnant of camel hair and a, a leather girdle and about his loins. His meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the regions around Jordan. Was he sitting in a pew every Sunday listening to the word or was he doing something in verse 5? Working. Doing stuff. He was doing something. You know what he was doing? He's sowing. He was making people ready for who? Jesus Christ. Who are you supposed to be making people ready for? To receive the word. The word is Jesus. Right? At the beginning was the word, and the word became flesh. Actually, the word is God, but it became flesh, and in, in flesh, it indwelled in man. And people say, really? The word is God? Yeah, the word was God. Remember, the Bible says God is a God that hides himself behind the veil. What is the veil? It is, it is Christ, but what is the veil? The flesh. God hid himself in Jesus Christ. He's a God that hides himself behind the veil. So when you reject Jesus, who have you rejected? God. You see what I'm saying? He tells you himself, he's a, he's a God that hides himself behind the veil. That's why now, in, in, after Jesus died on the cross, 
What was torn in, in, in the uh, synagogue? The veil. The veil. No longer did we have to go through the priest or the high priest or anybody else to get to God. Now we get to God straight through Jesus Christ. And only through God, Christ. No more veil. No more veil because the veil was, on the other side of the veil was religion. And on the other side of the veil was God. And religion prevented most of them that were Jews from getting to God. So much so the deception that they actually crucified the thing that came to save them. Think about that. That's great deception. You waiting for eons. Everybody named their kid David because they thought that David was going to return. And David was going to save Jerusalem. David was the greatest king to them. And by the time Jesus got here to save them, they didn't even know who he was. Because of what? That road got so crooked and winding and everything. People got lost on the way. Verse 6. And were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. That's the gospel. I have to do something before I confess my sins. I have to realize that I am a Sinner. 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 If you're sitting here living with somebody, sleeping in fornication, you're not married, and nobody tells you that's a sin. Satan gets his way. But if I tell you that's a sin, and you say, look, baby, I love you. You love me. Let's get married. If she says no, well, I'm sorry. I, hey, it was nice. I'm gone. I'm trying to get right with God. I'm repenting. I can't be right with you unless I'm right with God. I can't be the man to my wife that I am today unless I'm right with God. You're, you have no value. All you are is flesh. Let me show you your value without God. Go back when you have a chance and read the creation of Adam. Now, it's, it's, a, it's a clearer read in the book of Jasher, but it's in the book of Genesis. Go back when we looked at Adam and, and when he, he made Adam from what? What do you make Adam from? Dirt. Dirt. That's your value. That's your value. People say, man, that's mean, Freddie. No, nope. that's your value. That's my value. Dirt. You know where my value comes from? When he breathed into me. When he breathed the spirit into me, then I became a living soul, the Bible says. Not before then. Before then, I was just dirt. That's why he also turns around in Jeremiah and tells you your children will fall to the ground as dung. Why? Because they don't have a whole, they don't have a Holy Spirit in them. Because why? You didn't put it in them. You didn't give them the word. You didn't make their path straight. And what's happening? Look in America. Are our children not falling to the ground worthless? No value? All you got to do is look on the weekend in Chicago and see how many, how many young men are getting shot and killed in Chicago on the weekend. Where's the value? No spirit, no value. Dumb. Seven. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, like you said, Richard, the political leaders and the church leaders, Come to his baptism, he said unto them, O oh, generation of vipers. What is a viper? A I... serpent. How does a serpent work? Is he, is he fast enough to chase you down and catch you and devour you? He lays hmm? in wait. He lays in wait. He waits, he waits for what, Richard? For the opportunity opportunity how many opportunities in a day do we give satan think about it i'm not asking that as a question it's rhetorical but that's what he does he camouflages himself in this case he may be a preacher he may, may be the choir member he may be your boss he may be your best friend he may be your girlfriend he may be your boyfriend camouflages himself until you get close enough to him for him to wrap his coils around you, he squeezes the life out of you, in this case, the spirit of God, 
And he does it by going to the nightclubs. He does it by going drinking. He does it by going to the strip clubs. He does it by any means necessary. He knows what you like. But once he has gotten the life out of you, then he's going to open his mouth. And what is he going to do? Devour. Devour you. Swallow your hope. Vipers. Who has warned you to flee? Because that's what, the, that's what these two groups were doing to the men and women of God. That's why he's calling them vipers, righteously calling them vipers. They were squeezing the, the spirit out of them, and they were swallowing them up in the church. And they were thinking just because they were tithing and they had positions in the church, they were saved. And John didn't say that. John said, wait a minute. You need to repent. You need to go into water, and you need to repent. Of what? What do you do? What are you repenting of? In verse 8, bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance. What are you repenting of? Sin. Sin. There goes your once saved, always saved. And think not to say within yourself, we have Abraham as our fathers. Don't think because you're Baptist. Don't think because you're Christian. Don't think because you're whatever denomination you think, and your mom was that, and your brother was that, and you work in the church. Don't think that your position in an organization or a family is going to get you saved. Because for all have done what? Sin and fallen short. Fallen short. These people thought because of their titles and their positions, they were good. On their way to hell. Don't lie, like we said last week, to yourself. Get sin out of your life. Ten, and no, and now all the axe is laid. Also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Everyone. There's no exception to that. And if you're not bringing forth fruit, that's the other part of that. And Jesus picks that up with the, the parable of the talents. You got the one that brings forth fruit, right? He gets five talents. He doubles it. You get the one that gives two talents. He doubles those talents. Then you get the one that got one talent, and what did he do with it? Buried it. Buried it. Did it bring forth any fruit? What happened to that guy, that servant? He was still a servant. In other words, he was still in the body of Christ. He was a servant, but he didn't produce fruit. There's a lot of people claiming to be Christians, which is fine if that's what you want to do. But are you producing fruit meant for repentance, meat for repentance? Are you telling people what God demands of us? Are you telling people the word of God? Are you telling people things that are going to convict them to change the direction that they're going and turn to God? That's for, now, if they don't, that's, that's up to them. You've done your part, right? But the field, the Bible says the field is full. But the sowers are what? Harvesters are what? Few, few. Verse 11, indeed, I, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Holy Ghost and fire. Why? Because everything that I'm doing that goes against the word once I learn the word, every time I read something that I'm that that I'm not supposed to should burn me. Hey, you remember how old people used to say, son, you're playing with fire? That's what you're doing when you're playing with sin. You know the word, the word's coming to you, you hear. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy as a sign between me and you that I am your God. But you say, eh, I ain't going to keep the Sabbath. Everybody else goes to church on Sunday. You're playing with fire. Show me in the Bible where God said to go to church on Sunday. He said, remember the Sabbath. Matter of fact, of all the Ten Commandments, the only one that starts with the word remember is the fourth. Why? Because he knew you were going to forget the same all right verse 12 
whose fan is in his hands. What happens when you fan a fire? It spreads. <laughs> it gets bigger, it spreads. His fan is in his head, and he will thoroughly, it means you ain't going to sneak in, purge his floor and gather his wheat. What is he trying to gather? The wheat into his garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. That's the tares. If it ain't fruit, if it ain't fruit, if it ain't meat for repentance, it's going to burn up. Gone. And when you get to the judgment, as I'm not talking to the world, I'm talking about the saints. When you get to the judgment and the master of the house comes back and he says, I gave you my son on the cross for your salvation, what you do with it? What do you have to answer him with? If you haven't produced any fruit, what are you going to say? I'm just saying to you, what are you going to say? I mean, if I gave my son to go to the cross and have that brutal fate for the salvation of man, and then man is saved by that and have the opportunity to be saved by that, and you sit in the house of God your whole life, and you never produce any fruit? What do you expect God to say to you? I got three sons. I wouldn't have gave any of them for you. I, I'm not there yet. I'm just being honest with you. But if I did, and you didn't go out and produce meat for repentance, you don't think I'm going to have an issue with you? And I'm not God. Just Think about it. 13, then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to baptize of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answered and said, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. Why? Because Jesus is our example. And if he got baptized, and he was sinless. Don't you think I should get baptized and I'm a sinner? And people say, well, what happened to the thief on the cross that was going to be in the kingdom with, with Jesus that day? He says he's going to be in the kingdom with me and my father. He didn't get baptized. So everybody that died before they could get baptized and they've accepted Jesus, Jesus already got baptized for you. You see how that works? You didn't have to get baptized. You're sinless. But just like he took on my sin, he took on all my inequities, all my deficiencies. And he made a way where there seemed to be no way. You follow that? What a great God we have and serve. Baptized in 16. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight away, but out of the water. And lo, the heavens were open unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending. Now we see the Spirit of God, that thing that was going to fill him. Like, like a dove, not a dove. A lot of people will try to paint this, especially in some of the churches. They try to paint the Holy Spirit as a dove. It's not a dove. He says he's descending as a dove. And if you've ever seen a dove, he kind of takes his time. He comes down real slow, and he just barely flaps his wings, and he comes down really slow so he can land exactly where he wants to land. Have you ever seen a bird land on an on a electrical wire? He just kind of comes down, and he glides in, and he, he sits down exactly where he wants to sit down. He wants to sit down exactly on, the sun, on his son, Jesus. So we see this, the weed and the tares again. Weed and the tares, back to the weed and tares. Bryce, can you pray for us? Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us this opportunity to come before you, to be in your presence, Father, to help us understand. Most importantly, pray that you would open up our hearts and our minds to receive your word. Help us to understand uh, the act of repentance and getting our lives and our houses in order. If there's things that we haven't uh, let go of that keep us as you get ready to come closer, Father. And these things we pray and ask. Amen. My bad, Derek. I, I, I said Bryce was here a minute ago, so I was. You're good. 
I was thinking about Bryce. Uh, but that was Derek. So let's let's do a quick review. Let's go to Matthew 12. And we'll review a little bit of what we, we looked at last week. And then we'll jump into the outline. Matthew 12, 33 to 45, Derek. We're going to cover a little bit more because we didn't pick up 38 to 45. We picked up 33 to 37. But I want to, I mentioned Jonah and, and Christ, Christ preaching for three and a half years and Jonah preaching for three and a half days. So I just wanted to cover it all the way to 45. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. O offspring of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But, so, but I say unto you that every idle word that man shall speak, they shall give account, therefore, in the day of judgment. For by your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Rabbi, we would see a sign from you. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous nation seeks after a sign, and there shall be no sign given, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was there, uh, was three days and three nights in the fish's belly, so shall the son of Adam be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this nation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this nation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost part, parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. When the unclean ruach or spirit is gone out of a man, he walks through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he finds it empty, swept and garnished. Then goes he and takes with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked nation. Amen. Sin is like a cancer. If you get one that comes in and dwells and you kick it out and you don't get yourself fixed on the word of God of truth, it's going to come back with seven others and you're going to have more sin in your life or different natures of sin in your life. Uh, does anybody see anything stand out there in the review? Do you all see in, in verse 34, Jesus calling them the same thing John called them? Generation of vipers. Again, when you hear, when you hear God and the word talk in reference to an animal, always go back and look at the nature of that animal. And it'll give you more understanding of how these men and women are working to deceive you. And we already discussed what a viper does to, to deceive you. You've got to get close to you first. Remember, he's got to get close to you. You ain't got to worry about the people that aren't close to you. A viper has to get close to you. He ain't going to chase you down. He ain't fast enough. There's a couple of snakes that are pretty fast, but most vipers are slow. So they have to conceal their self, camouflage their self, just like he says, wolves and sheep's clothing. A wolf in sheep's clothing means the wolf has camouflaged himself. He looks like a sheep, but he's actually a wolf. And these people are in the house of God. These people are in the church. These are the wheat and the tares growing together. We have to be aware of that. Anything stand out to y'all? Uh, you covered it a little bit, but uh, verse 44 and 45 when he's talking about that spirit um and one the the fact that he calls it uh, the spirit returns into his house right mm -hmm. so just the context of like this is a place where um the spirit has dwelled like it's his own habitation right like it's comfortable there yeah. um and that's the that's you know to me where i'm gonna go back to what was uh john said in verse in chapter three about uh bringing fruits of repentance right 
because like sin is not a joke and it really is something that you have to um, work diligently to get out because if you don't and you just entertain it and continue to entertain it, then you, you're just just adding more mess into yourself and, and more problems that are only going to uh, make it harder for when you do try to get right, you know? It goes back to a, a verse that a lot of people get wrong in scripture a lot of times. Ask in my name, right? And my father will do it, right? The problem with sin a lot of times, just like we see with the disciples trying to deal with the man that had that evil spirit in him for a long time. And then when Jesus comes over, he asks, hey, uh, who are you? And he says, we're legion. Remember that? We're legion. And the, the disciples had a hard time getting that legion spirit out of that man. And a legion is about 1,600 spirits, 1,600 troops in a Roman uh, formation. So that tells you how many spirits was in this one man and how they felt comfortable being in that one man. But Jesus said something to the disciples. He said, These, this type of spirit is not removed from a person without prayer and what fasting and what do we do when we fast aren't we going to the father aren't we denying ourselves mm -hmm. denying the flesh so again sometimes we don't get out of our sins because we got to think we got to do it through our own strength but some sins you're not going to be able to conquer through your own strength mm -hmm. you got to go ask god yep. you got to pray you got to fast that's what Jesus said. You got this, this kind you got to deal with through prayer and fasting. Just trying to give you understanding uh, and, 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 and add to what Derek was giving us there. Anybody else see anything? Richard, you good? Yeah, verse uh, 35, it said, a good man out of the treasures of the heart bringeth forth good things and an evil man out of the evil treasures bring it forth evil things and and then it says uh you but i say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment for by the words uh thou shall be justified and by the words thou shall be condemned and so to go back up to verse uh, 35, it says, out of the treasure of the heart, a good man. So that lets you know that God is dealing with the heart of a good man, but an evil man is it, more where they're going off of, off of what they think and they are being led by Satan mm -hmm. because they are not dealing with the heart. There, there is no change. I mean, it's just whatever they think is right or whatever they think is good, then that's what they're going to, that, and that's evil because it has nothing to do, it, it's, it's separated, it's separated, it's not having to deal with God or, or, or what you're supposed to be doing, it's you are dealing with, with, with the, flesh. And mm -hmm. the flesh, and the flesh is being controlled by Satan. Yeah. And so you, you're going to give account for those things that you say and you, you, you and when you lead people astray, and it's like the blind leading the blind. They both going to fall in the ditch. That's it. You know, and even then, Jesus gets you on what you're saying there, uh, Richard, because Jesus comes back and says, the disciple says, uh, one, one of the guys uh, says, good man to Jesus, right? And Jesus turns around and says to him, after being called a good man, Jesus turns around to him and says, there's none good but who? Father. But the father. So again, I don't care how good I am. If I don't have the Holy Spirit, I don't have a father. So what good can come out of my heart? Nothing. Nothing. There's nothing there. Nothing. Mm -hmm. Nothing but evil. Men is evil and evil continually, the Bible says. So unless I have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, I mean, and Jesus gave us a great example. If Jesus says to someone that no man's good and he's being called good, 
he's letting you know he wouldn't even be good. And I know people might say, that's blasphemy. And, they, and, and I'm not trying to blaspheme Christ. He's trying to give you an extreme example of there's nothing good in the flesh. The only good is spirit, is the spirit and that spirit that comes from God, the Holy Spirit, not the spirit that comes from Satan. Does that, does that add to that any? Yes. All right, good. Uh, DJ, you got anything? Uh, um, I guess I just want understanding on uh, verses 43, 44 says, when an evil spirit leaves a person, it goes into the desert seeking rest, but finding none. Then it says, I'll return to the person I came from. So it returns and finds its former home empty, swept, and in order. Um, I guess I just wanted like some some more understanding of those. Let's look at that real quick. Right Let's there. look at that real quick. In the Bible, uh, we have uh, the we have the Spirit of God represented in several different ways. One of the ways we have it uh, represented is water. Right? We see Jesus at the well and he tells the woman, if you drink the water that I give you, you'll never thirst again. Right? We also see the opposite of that in the book of Revelations. We see Satan using water, right? To, to, to basically try to drown the church. In, in Revelation, the Bible calls it the woman, but it's, it's in reference to the church. So this particular spirit, we see when an unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places. That's places that don't have the spirit of God. No water, no truth. It's dry. Seeking rest and findeth none. It don't have it. It doesn't have what he wants. He wants water, but what water does he want? He wants water from his father. He wants, he wants false doctrine. He wants lies. He wants anything that lets him stay in sin or makes that host keep him where he wants to be. So then he says, 44, then he says, I will return to my house. I'm going to go back to that same person. Why? Because that person let me have a home there. And you just think about it this way. If you, you have a nice, a nice place there. If you let some guy that you meet on the street come in and just hang out on your couch and eat your food, never has to work, never has to clean up, do you think he's going anywhere? Nope. Okay, so finally you get tired of it and you kick him out. And then he goes out and he can't find a place that'll take him in and treat him like DJ treated him. Where do you think he's going to go back to? He's going to come back to where he's comfortable. <laughs> you think yeah. he's going to be better or worse? He's going to be worse. worse. Especially if you open yep. the door and let him back in. But in this case, we're not talking about John. We're talking about a spirit. We're not talking about Pete. We're talking about a spirit, an evil spirit at that, right? Does that make sense to you? Yes, sir. All right. Let's hit this outline. Everybody good? Yes, sir. All right. Let's go to Matthew 13. Matthew 13. Matthew 13, uh, 1 through 17, Derek. The same day went Yehusha out of the house and sat by the seaside, and great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat. And the whole multitude stood on the shore, and he spoke many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow, and when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, <clears throat> and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who has ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speak you unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever has to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance, 
but whosoever has not for him shall be taken away uh, even that he has. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they see, they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. What, did you say 17? Or... Yes, 17. Okay. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which says, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing. And their eyes they have closed, at least at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should turn back, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For a man I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye, have, which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. What y'all see there? Anything? Verse 11 for me. Okay. Uh, it says, He answered and sent them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. And that's just, not everyone is going to understand and not everyone's called to perceive the truth, right? Or to receive the truth. Um, and so, and deeper than that for me, it's just like the importance of when you do come into the understanding of truth, that that's not just happenstance, right? Like God is opening up your eyes and your understanding for a reason, because like we've said, um, we have work to do. So um, that should be like a, like a honor, I guess, or like a good feeling, right? And you should get up and do something about it and not just um, take it for granted, right? Right. Now, this is a parable, and in, 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 in theology, we call this the parable of the sower. So I like to say the husbandman or the saint or the one that was been set aside for a purpose, as you, you picked up, Derek, that purpose is to what? So. So take the gospel to the nations. That's what he calls the elect. That's what he calls the predestines. We don't like to say that in, in religion, but he, it's all through the Bible. The elect, my election. You're predestined for a purpose. To sow righteousness in the earth. Right? So that's what you're picking up there. But again, what is he saying in verse 11? What is he saying? The kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. Highlight that in verse 11. Again, he's, he's not talking about the kingdom of God yet. He's talking about the kingdom of heaven, which you're going to be kings and priests. And you're going to have a job to do. The king is the one that keeps the, the rules or the law. The priest is the ones that teach the law or the rules. Kings and priests, government and the church within the body of Christ. Say that again. Kings and priests. In the millennial kingdom, when we're with Jesus Christ, we're going to be kings and priests. A king is the, the head of government. He's head of government, the political, the one that keeps the laws of that kingdom. The priests are the ones that teach, in this case, righteousness to the people of the kingdom. That's why you're going to be kings and priests. Amen. That's going to be your job. Your husbandman. You're going to make sure that kingdom, everybody that gets in that kingdom are going to follow the ways and the rules of the most high. Ain't going to be no tares in there. Right? But good, Derek. Richard, you got anything? Yes. Uh, in the, with the, the seed, uh, that fell to the wayside, the, the different uh, seeds. The, to me, this is uh, my understanding is that these are all the different people reacting to the word in different ways. This is the wheat and the turf again. Exactly. Exactly. Him, him dividing those two. But he's telling you that, let's, let's, let's put it this way, before they are designated one or the other, 
before they get a chance to be designated one or the other, there's an environmental situation that's happening to them, right? Yes. You see that? Yes. And depending on that environment is going to depending where they end up producing fruit or not. And at the end of those environments that that's happening, they're either going to show themselves to be fruit or tares. Wheat or tares. Well, wheat is my fruit. But but yes, each one is a different environment and it, each different environment causes most of them to be, as you said, tares, right? because of the conditions of the environment that they fall in, in this case, the, the religious or spiritual environment that they fall in. Good. DJ, you got anything? Um, no, sir. All right, let's, let's keep looking at this. Uh, 1331, what do we read? Just, what do we read to, 30? Yeah, let's go. No, I read a 17. You read 17? All right, let's go uh, 18 to 23. Uh, hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understands it, uh, he, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understands it not, then comes the wicked one and catches away the, that which was sown in his heart. This is he, which, uh, oh, I can't, I can't read right now. This is he which re which received seed by the wayside, but he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that hears the word and immediately with the joy receives it. Yet has he not root in himself, but endures for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by he is offended. He also that receives seed, uh. That receives seed among the thorns is he that hears the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful but he that receives seed unto the good ground is he that hears the word and understands it which also bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold some 60 some 30. Amen. so we see the different environments richard you see that yes jesus comes uh, back and explains the different environments everyone has the potential to bear fruit but because of those different environments, they don't. And the only one that really bears fruits is verse 23. But he that receives his seed into a good ground is he that heareth the word. So we, we hear something, we take it in and understand this. It. That's the other part. You have to understand what you're hearing. And then which also beareth fruit. Now what do I have to do? I have to do what the word tells me to do. I have to become a husbandman and I have to go out and bear fruit. In this case, I'm just going to use y'all as an example. Uh, y'all are fruit. I am fruit for y'all and y'all are fruit for me. Why? Because we're learning the word of God together. We're cutting up the word of God. The Bible says iron sharp as iron, right? So we're, we're fruit, we're bearing fruit. And then when we, take, when we take what we've learned of the word on Wednesday night to our families and to the world, are we bearing fruit? Are we planting seed? Because God's word is the seed. Yes. You're planting seed. When you take it outside of this Bible study, you're planting seed. And now you're, you're actually bearing more fruit, right? And then, like I said at the beginning of this Bible study, when you go before the most high, and he asks you, what did you do with my son? You can say you did something with him, right? You produce more fruit, sixfold, what does it say? Sixfold, 60-fold, 160-fold, 30-fold, depending on what, what you have the ability to do. Let's do one more because I really wanted to get into the wheat and tares. We're still in the sower. So let's do, let's do one, one more, one or two more, and then we'll be done. Let's go to Matthew 13, 20, 24, 24 to 30. Now we're going to move into the wheat and the tares. We've been looking at the sower, and we're going to move into the wheat and tares. <clears throat> Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men sleep, 
uh, while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. When the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared uh, the tares also. So the servants of the house came and said unto him, Adonai, did not you sow good seed in your field? Uh, from whence it came, from whence it came, uh, where it then has it tares. He said unto them, An enemy has done this. The servants said unto him, Will you, will you then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, at least while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together unto the harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather you together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn together, and to, to burn them, but gather the wheat into the, my barn. Amen. So does everybody know what a sickle is? Mm -mm. It's the big old blade that they, that the, you can say the early forefathers used to cut down the, the, the wheat when they had that big old round blade and they go like this. <laughs> yeah. yeah have you ever sickle. seen the Russian flag? Yes. That's mm -hmm. a sickle. Yeah. If you want to know what a sickle is, look at the Russian flag. There's, there's a sickle on the Russian flag. And like Richard said, it's, a, it's kind of a almost a half moon shaped thing with mm -hmm. a handle on it. And they use it and they swing it back and forth to cut the weed at a certain level uh, because most of the fruit is on the top of that 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 uh wheat so that that's basically what a sickle is but again he starts the parable with what the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man who has sowed good seed in the field you see that he's still talking about the kingdom of heaven because he's talking about the church the good seed the field is the church the good seed is the word of God, but you're, you're supposed to be that thing that's coming up, playing fruit, being the fruit. So he says a parable that the, the, the parable, man, I'm getting like you, Derek, he's gone. But another parable put forth unto them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man which sowed good seed in the field. That, who, who do you think sowed that seed spiritually? Christ. Yes, Christ. Right? But while men slept, his enemy, because the enemy of Christ is Satan. Remember, Satan wanted to be Christ. He wants to reap the harvest. He don't want Christ to reap the harvest. He wanted to sit on the mercy seat. He didn't want Christ to sit on the mercy seat. But while the man slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. He, that's Satan. He came in and he, he's always going to put in your midst a person that's going to try to pull you away or choke you like the serpent, like the viper. Choke any spiritualness out of you. It might be your friend that says, hey, let's go out and do this or let's go out and do that. It might you never know who it is, but like I said, like a viper is going to most of the time be someone that's close to you because it has to get close to you. And then 26, but when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servant of the householder came and said unto him, sir, did thou know, did thou not sow good seed in the field for whence? Then have these tares come from? Uh, God, we know, Christ, we know you didn't do this. Where did this come from? These are the servants. These are those who have truth, that have spiritual truth, that have spiritual discernment, that are looking at the church. I know people say, man, LT, you're always on the church. Why? Because I see the tares. You have to have spiritual discernment to see the tares. Right, Richard? That's correct. Once you get spiritual discernment, now you're saying back to Christ, how did all these tares get in here amongst the wheat? How did all these wolves get in here amongst the sheep? What do you want me to do about it? Well, 
He said unto them, an enemy has done this. The servant said unto him, will thou then that we go and gather them up? Let, let's go pick them up out of the church. Let's get them out of here. Verse 29, but it said, nay, at least while ye gather up the tares, ye root also up the wheat with them. Why? Because everybody receives the word different at a different pace, at a different process. And just because you look like a tear today, do I really know that you're not going to be weak tomorrow? And people say, well, what, what are you talking about? What if Saul would have been plucked up out of the church? He would have never been Paul. You see what I'm saying? Yes. He didn't start bearing fruit till he was Paul. So God's saying, let them grow together because he knows the end of things, but I don't. All I know is what I'm seeing. I'm judging them by their fruit. But if they hadn't started producing fruit yet, then I can't discern that. So let them grow together until the harvest. Do you see that? Yes. All right. We're going to stop there. We'll pick up there next week. Richard, can you pray for us? Father God, we come before you now in Jesus' name. And we want to give you thanks again for being able to come together and for you giving us understanding and, and insight for uh, oversight and for the uh, work that we have to do, Lord. And Lord, we ask you to continue to, to bless us, to keep us. And Lord, as we turn to you and, and look towards you uh, for uh, more insight, we just want to say thank you and praise you and give you thanks forever and ever. Amen. 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 All right.